Hello, and welcome to the lecture on magical realism. In this lecture, we'll be talking about two stories, the fortune teller and a very old man with enormous wings. We'll be looking at the qualities of magical realism and exploring how these two stories have elements of those qualities. This week, our final week of Unit 2, we will look at the way realism and fantasy have combined into a new type of mode called magical realism. This mode is very popular in contemporary literature, that is, literature written by authors who are still living or who wrote in the late 20th century. Magical realism blends together fantasy and realism to ask us to question which is more true in the story, the fantasy elements or the real. By now you should know the qualities of realism and fantasy quite well. If you get confused about the modes, you may want to go back and look carefully at the lecture notes from this unit especially as you begin to prepare for the Unit 2 exam. I want to give you a list of the way magical realism combines realism and fantasy, so you can compare this mode to the two separate ones. Magical realism contains fantastical elements. The fantastic elements may be intrinsically plausible, which means they might be believable or could actually happen, but they are never explained by the narrator or author. Characters accept rather than question the logic of the magical elements in the story. This means that they take the magic or fantasy at face value and it does not appear unusual to them. Magical realism usually incorporates legend or folklore. The mode often shifts between characters' viewpoints and can give internal narration on shared relationships or memories. This means not everything will be presented from outside or from inside, but may shift between both perspectives. Like realism, the author leaves the story open-ended so the reader determines whether the magical or the mundane rendering of the plot is more truthful or in accord with the world as it is. This means we decide if the magical elements are more true or if the realistic elements are more true. So while the modes of realism and fantasy may blend in different degrees, in psychological realism, for example, where fantasy is shown in the case of madness, or in pure fantasy that may contain realistic elements to help readers interpret it, magical realism is different in that we as readers are supposed to weigh the qualities of the mode as we interpret the story's meaning. Let's start by looking at The Fortune Teller by Joaquim Maria Machado de Assis, a Brazilian author who wrote in the late 19th century. Mercado de Assis lived and wrote in Brazil, where he published novels, short fiction, plays, and poetry. He is considered by many critics to be the greatest Brazilian writer of all time, even though he was not as famous during his own lifetime. Mercado de Assis would be considered more of a traditional realist by current definitions of the modes, but I think we can see the roots of magical realism in his work. Remember, magical realism contains actual supernatural elements, but in a realistic setting. Mikado de Assis's story, The Fortune Teller, takes place in a realistic setting, but the undertones connected to the fortune teller's power make us, as readers, question whether the supernatural is real or not. Does the fortune teller actually know what is happening, we ask, or are the characters just naive? The conclusion of the story shows us that, in fact, the characters are just fooling themselves and the ending remains squarely in the realistic mode. There is not actually any power held by the fortune teller. However, the questions that are raised as we read along create a type of suspense based on whether or not the supernatural is real. In this way, part of the story's value lies in its questioning of mode. As we read, we must ask, is the story a fantasy? Is it realistic? What will you, as a reader, end up believing before the author tells you which choice is right? This tension and suspense is created solely by juxtaposing the modes of fantasy and realism. So, while the story is not fully developed magical realism, it does show how the two modes in tension create a need for interpretation by the reader, and this interpretation must make sense of how the supernatural and the realistic combine, and which one of the two extremes has more importance. This is an important feature of traditional magical realism, and we can see the roots of it here in Mikado de Assis's story. Let's see an example of typical magical realism in the work of another South American writer, 
Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a Colombian author that lived and worked in South America, though he mainly resided in Mexico City. He's credited with, with being one of the first authors to use magical realism, although many South American authors and those in other countries use this form today. Marquez won a Nobel, Nobel Prize in Literature for his work. He's written many novels and short stories, and some of his novels have been made into movies. In the story A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings, the characters first encounter an old man with wings in their yard, and initially they are afraid. Marquez's narrator tells us that they keep looking at him until he seems familiar, and when he talks, they just ignore the wings and accept him. This is the first indication of magical realism. The magical elements are just accepted by the characters, so we as readers need to accept them too. The neighbor explains to Peleo and Elisinda that the old man is actually an angel, and this is how the narrator refers to him during most of the story. However, even though we have a supernatural occurrence, this story is not pure fantasy. Marquez still describes the world of the story using realistic details. For example, his description of the old man, or angel, is not elevated. He's old and dressed in rags and seems like he's falling apart. This overturns conventional depictions of angels as holy or beautiful, making them more realistic. Also, we don't travel to a fantasy realm or other world in this story. The supernatural occurs, but it still occurs in the everyday, almost mundane world that we inhabit. As the story progresses, we can see how Marquez points out the difference between our expectations of the supernatural and the potential reality we may encounter. People don't seem to respect the angel because his miracles are not the kind they want. And when the priest tries to understand him based on religious conventions, the angel doesn't fit expectations again, just like his appearance. The priest decides to write to various church officials rather than trusting what he sees. He can't believe his own eyes, so he appeals to authority and tradition. You may not have seen it on a first read-through, but there is a lot of humor in this story. Marquez uses fantastic imagery along with more realistic imagery, and putting these two types together can seem absurd at times, making us laugh. The tone of the narrator is also more casual and light, telling us the old man's story more for entertainment, at least on the surface. Marquez uses stereotypes of angels used for humor in particular. For example, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Eventually, the angel loses his fame because a spider with a woman's head teaches the community a lesson about disobeying one's parents. We should wonder about what this means for the community. Why do they need the miraculous? They want to make sense of it by creating a lesson or meaning. In fact, the lesson has to be obvious within parameters they understand. The angel doesn't fit their expectations, and his miracles aren't what they want, so they reject him. In the end, the angel regrows wings and leaves them. Elisinda is relieved, because he's not real anymore. She can only imagine him again, and this is how the story include, concludes. She watches him until she can no longer see him, and she is able to just imagine what he looks like instead of having to see him in real life. So the story is concerned with contrasting our fantasies with the realities. We have preconceived expectations about reality and the supernatural, and Marquez seems to suggest that when our expectations are broken, we don't really like that. We prefer our fantasies. Obviously, this story suggests that we may prefer religious images to their potential realities, but the spider with the woman's head is not a religious image and represents a more stable kind of fantasy that coheres with expectations. I think the message has undertones of religious critique, as well as broader implications about our perceptions of reality and what we do when we encounter something or someone that doesn't fit our expectations. Ultimately, magical realism as a mode asks us to think about truth in a different way, by putting our fantasies into real form for us to see in a story. Unlike the Arabian Nights, which was pure fantasy, the fortune teller and a very old man should make us think about how our fantasies connect to reality and what we would do if they came to life. Thanks.